uh, welcome everyone to the second annual Charles Gerson uh, Memorial Lectureship. And uh, I just want to start before I introduce today's speaker by uh, talking about Charles Gerson. Um, and this is history provided by Mary Joan Gerson. Uh, Charles uh, finished his fellowship in GI at Mount Sinai Hospital uh, after he returned from Nigeria as a Peace Corps physician. That was in 1968. After that, he taught at Mount Sinai from 1969 through 2013, and by the time he finished his tenure here, he was a clinical professor of medicine. He served as the director of the gastroenterology clinic between 1991 and 1996, and he was, an act he was active in many other ways at Mount Sinai, including having served on the executive steering committee, the GI center's advisory committee, and the Physician's Advisory Committee and received the Distinguished Service Award from the Department of Medicine at Mount Sinai Hospital. During the first decade of his medical career, he was a half-time researcher investigating small bowel absorption with a focus on tropical screw and authored or co-authored three dozen published articles in peer-reviewed journals. In 2001, he and his wife, Dr. Mary Joan Gerson, a psychologist who had an appointment in the GI division, began investigating irritable bowel syndrome from a mind-body perspective and initiated a collaborative study uh, in which they saw patients together in a very innovative model. And they followed this by a study of group therapies in the same model. They then initiated an international study of interpersonal dynamics and mind-body attribution of symptoms in eight countries, followed by another international study examining attachment patterns, catastrophizing and negative pain beliefs, as well as the first study of group hypnotherapy and IDS treatment. Charles served on the Rome Foundation working team on cross-cultural multinational research in the FGID's uh, group, which has collectively published several articles. And Charles was sought after as a functional GI consultant in the latter years of his practice. And when he retired, his patients wrote fairly extraordinary testimonials to his expertise and concern. So that's the prose, and now the color to the prose, which was that Charles was uh, in every measure, a wonderful physician, a wonderful advocate for his patients, um, had really innovative models of care in collaboration with Mary Joan, um, and really uh, added to the luster of Mount Sinai over his many years here. And he was just an absolute gentleman to know and deal with. Um, so it's very wonderful that um, through Mary Joan's support and his family's support that we're able to bring internationally renowned speakers each year uh, to talk in the realm of functional GI disorders. And today, we're extremely privileged to have Dr. Doug Drossman here, a native New Yorker, um, I see, uh, went to Jamaica High School, so maybe that means he lived in Queens, I guess, and had his BA cum laude from Hofstra, his MD from Einstein, and then went on to study internal medicine at UNC Chapel Hill, uh, during his senior residency here at Bellevue. Um, in between all of that, he was later a U.S. Air Force major um, and then was a fellow in medicine and psychiatry and psychosomatic medicine. So this is a very different pathway for anyone in gastroenterology. I think he's a real trailblazer in that regard. Then he continued his GI training at University of North Carolina Chapel Hill under the illustrious leadership of Don Powell and rose through the ranks to be professor of medicine and psychiatry at UNC, and then in 2012, professor emeritus. Um, most notably, he's the founder and president of the Rome Foundation. Of course, all of you know what that is and what they do, um, how they have really revolutionized our understanding of functional GI disorders and many other conditions of the GI tract. Uh, he's been honored as a master of the American College of Gastroenterology, president of the American Psychosomatic Society, uh, chair of the International Foundation for Functional GI Disorder Symposium for over 10 years uh, in the past, and has developed eight different validated questionnaires for clinical research in GI disorders. He has more than 230 original publications, dozens of books, scores of book chapters and monographs, um, and has lectured internationally, and now once again, I think for the third time maybe in his life, here at Mount Sinai. So it's a real pleasure to welcome Dr. Drossman here today as the second annual Charles Gerson Award. You can go in your office. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, took up a lot of my time. But... <laughs> 
<laughs> well, that's your fault. <laughs> no, it's on the laptop. So. Oh, just, just use the laptop. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Um, sorry for a little bit of the delay. And, and, uh, my talk will go about an hour. The, the good stuff is toward the end, but feel free at 9 o'clock. You just miss some important stuff. <laughs> uh, it's it's a, it's really a delight and, a, and an honor to be able to be the second fellow, uh, the second visiting professor. I knew Charles uh, Charles back in uh, the late '90s, and Mary Joan, and they did some really seminal work in the beginning in looking at cross cultural aspects of mind body uh, relationships, and I even refer patients. To Center. So we harmonize a lot in looking at what we're calling now the biopsychosocial model, the relationship with brain gut interactions. And that's what we're going to cover today. Uh, I'm going to really present to you a case that actually occurred, and we're dramatizing it some with the video. Thank goodness it's working. And, and, and we'll move on from there to tell you not only the pathophysiology of how did this patient get to this point, but what do we do about it. Just want to start by saying that uh, this is from UNC and Perry and Bob Sandler uh, does this every five or six years, and you can see that the by national database of office and emergency room visits that pain is way up on top in terms of what you see. Now this is any pain. Most of this might be acute and self-limited. What I want to talk about: what about the patient who keeps coming back with pain? Nothing seems to work. That's what I'm going to discuss. We adhere to what we're calling the biopsychosocial model. This is what has been the basis of my research, starting with early life factors and then looking at its influence on the brain and the gut. And the interaction is the brain gut axis, leading to what the clinical presentation is and what we see are the health outcomes. I'm going to quickly go through a case because you're going to see it as well. But this was a patient who must have been about 10 years now, pain with chronic and severe abdominal pain, nausea, constipation. I'm going to say this very quickly and save time. Recurrent pain started at age 6. Age 19, she went to Mexico, got post, uh, gastroenteritis, became uh, IBSD, what we now call post-infection IBS. And then something happened. The pain got more frequent, more severe, changed from diarrhea to constipation, and then it became constant pain. We now call centrally mediated abdominal pain and started to develop comorbidities like fibromyalgia, migraines, on a variety of medications, <clears throat> had multiple procedures, all of which were negative, even had an egg slap five years Ooh. prior to seeing me uh, for end they found possible endometriosis, put her on a GNRH agonist, didn't really help, had a low ejection fraction, uh, took out her gallbladder, that didn't help. Had multiple ER visits, started to get morphine uh, on Dancitron, and then they would discharge her on hydrocodone or oxycodone. Family physician would refill the opioids because didn't want to go back to the ER. What else did he, could he do? Five hospitalizations for pain when the ER visit was unsuccessful. A month before seeing me, the hospitalization, there was a second exploratory lab, which was negative. The patient was put on increasing morphine. And they were unable to de discharge her because of continuing pain. What they do? They got a psych consult. Psych consult said that there was major depression and PTSD from childhood, abuse and deprivation. Parents were divorced when she was 12, left home at age 16, pregnant at age 17, left spouse after four years because he was physically abusing her, currently living with her mother, unable to work, on disability. What did the psychiatry consult say? They said paroxetine go to the mental health center. <coughs> Didn't go to the mental health center. She was discharged on oxycodone and paroxetine. And now it's 4.30, Friday afternoon, coming to your office. <laughs> 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 Curled on the side with hips flexed, severe cramping, constipation has gotten worse. Abdominal exam shows generalized tenderness, coldness of the right and left, overlying the colon, and requests hospitalization. Oh. So, let's see what it's what it's like. So, I'll show you a video. This is a dramatized. 
Ms. Byers, I'm Megan, Dr. Grossman's PA. Nice to meet you. I'm going to take you back to see him now, okay? I'll grab your luggage. Follow me. Ms. Byers? Yeah? Dr. Grossman. Hi. I'm here to see you today. Yeah. So I'd like to talk to you a little bit. I wonder if you could come sit down in the chair. That'd be all right. Why don't we try to... Yeah, let me see if I can help you out. <laughs> don't forget my suitcase, okay? Ms. Byers, I, I looked at your records. You've had a lot of symptoms. You've been to a lot of doctors. Can you yeah. tell me? Tell me something about it. Well, it's really bad, doctor. I mean, I need you to give me something. Like, I need a shot of pain medication or something. It's, you know, I, I need you to call the ER and just tell them that I'm coming down because this is the only thing that will help manage my pain is when I'm in the hospital. Okay, well, you're here now. No, I'm, I'm, I need it now. You don't understand. I wonder if I could just understand a little bit more about <sighs> What the pain is like. Can you describe what it's like and what yeah. the symptoms you have? It's like stabbing knives, like into your gut, and it hurts. And it goes through your whole body. And I have constipation, and I have a he headache, and I feel like I'm going to throw up. And I'm sure that. None of this even matters because you probably don't care, but I just need you to help me, please. Uh, it sounds like this is really good. Help me. And you've not gotten a lot of good care. I want to try to help. Tell me more about maybe when this first began. It started um, about 10 years ago after I got back from a girl's trip to Mexico. And I got an infection, and it turned into IBS with diarrhea. And the doctors treated me for the diarrhea, but the pain never went away. And it's just gotten worse and worse and worse ever since. Then they gave me pain medicine, but then that's caused all this constipation. And, like, right now I haven't even been able to go to the bathroom in, like, 10 days. Oh. 10 days! I don't, I don't know what else to do. Okay, well, we're going to try to understand a little bit more and see if we can help. How about yeah. earlier? Had you had any symptoms earlier? Um, In your childhood? I had, a, I had some stomach pain off and on when I was a kid, but not like this. It was just like when my parents would have a fight or something would be going on and, you know, it just like you get a stomach ache. Um, but... Then my parents got divorced, and I, my mom and I fought a lot, and so I, I left when I was 16, and and then my stomach was okay. Um, I didn't really have any problems, and then I got pregnant, um, and my daughter was born, and everything was fine. But now it's so bad that I, I had to quit my job. I couldn't even work. I mean, I can't barely get out of bed most mornings, and... So I'm trying to raise my daughter by myself, and I lost my job, and I had to quit my job, so I had to move back in with my mom, which it just well, exacerbates the well, whole this, thing. This I just has been pretty hard. I yes. See that. How do they try to treat you for this? Well, my, so my primary care doctor doesn't know what else to do, so he he gives me like Percocets, but then that stopped working, and so. Um, he gave me a fentanyl patch, which worked for a while, but it, it's not effective anymore. That's why I need to go to the ER. Um, I go to the ER, they give me IV pain medication that's much stronger. They give me, like, morphine and uh, just whatever else they got that's strong, and it, it helps a lot. And that's why I need to go back. Did, did they ever put you on uh, what we now call neuromodulators or antidepressants? <laughs> Yes, I had this doctor that was like, oh, I think we need to try an antidepressant. And I, it's pissed me off. I'm not depressed. I mean, I, I don't know why he thought that would help. It didn't do anything. And I, it's not in my head. I keep telling him, the pain is not in my head. It's in my stomach. Like, treat my stomach. But... Okay. I guess what I'm saying is 
you know, have needed more and more opioids as well. Yeah. Narcotics. Well, yeah, it's the only thing that helps. Um, and my concern is that it's it could also make the constipation worse and could even make the pain worse. And so maybe we have to look at other options. So how would you feel if we were to look at a way to treat this and maybe get you off the narcotics because that could make things better? No, that's not going to make things better. I don't want to come off. They're the only, you're, you're not listening to me, Dr. Grossman. They're the only thing that works. Why would you suggest that I come off of them? I don't, Okay. this is the same thing I get with every doctor. All right, so let's let's do this. Let, uh, we're going to work with you. We're going to do a physical exam now. And when we come back, we'll talk about some options. Is that okay? Uh, yeah, okay. Fine. <laughs> <laughs> the question is, how do we get to this point? And what do we do about it? And I think that's going to be basically, we'll come back to the video at the end of how I tried to manage it. Uh, we don't have time to talk about this, but what comes out is a sense of frustration, helplessness. How do we help this woman? And so on. Uh, when fellow, when I see patients, these are the kind of patients that will come to my clinic. This was the fellow before I saw So, first thing we should talk I about is... I one of those every day. <laughs> Only one? Yeah. It's the same one. <laughs> the first thing is understanding the behavior. And the closest we can get with DSM-5 is illness, anxiety disorder, somatic symptom disorder. And what you're seeing is a pattern that reads true in patients with chronic they're not born with this, but with chronic pain and certain other predisposing comorbidities, you get to this sense of helplessness, nobody can help, frustration. So they, they tend to express the pain of varying intensity through verbal and not verbal ways. You saw how what happened in the waiting yeah. room, uh, seeking health care frequently, taking personal taking limited personal yeah. risk. Most of the data on chronic pain is that the patient has to take feel ownership of the illness and take responsibility for the care. If they leave it, that they're coming to you saying, what are you going to do for me now, Doc? Mm -hmm. And you assume that responsibility. It's not going to work. And you're burdened with something that they have to be shared with you. Uh, focusing attention on complete relief of symptoms, selective attention, making requests for narcotics, mm -hmm. requiring diagnostic studies, <laughs> minimizing a role with potential for psychosocial factors, which then become Challenging, it's not in my head. Uh, urgent reporting of intense symptoms. So that's the pattern. Now, to understand this, we have to understand brain gut interactions. And it really begins with the embryo. This is the uh, developing the, the, the neural crest that forms. The endoderm, this is, eventually becomes the brain and the spinal cord. And early in fetal development, there are ganglia that migrate down to the endoderm. And that becomes the myenteric plexus, the enteric nervous system. So we have a hardwired system. And what that means, unlike other organ systems, is that the neurotransmitters receptors are the same in the brain and the gut, which means we can borrow from the work done in psychiatry and use those medications to deal with this, both of the GI tract and also in the brain's regulation of the GI tract. So if you follow her life history, she started with abdominal pain, uh, developed post-infection IBS. This converted to IBS-C. She then got chronic abdominal pain, central immediate abdominal pain. And then this was complicated with opioids to OIC, it's something we've originally reported, which is the narcotic bowel syndrome, which is central hyperalgesia. So not oh, okay. okay. So if we look at the evolution of this. Go ahead, yeah, keep going. So the post-infection IBS was just published. Uh, was just published uh, this past year uh, by the Rome working team, which is the STEM is the, the criteria for irritable bowel syndrome, pain associated with change of bowel habit, change of frequency. And it should develop immediately after an acute infectious gastroenteritis. And that's defined by either a positive stool culture or fever, two of, uh, at least two of fever, vomiting, and diarrhea. 
That's the preset. Now, I know in my experience, patients often may have IBS to start, but then they get an acute infection, and then it gets worse again for months or years later. It tends to be a better prognosis than lifelong IBS, but uh, it, is a, it is something to consider. And the way we look at this is not too different from IBD in some ways, that you have uh, an infection, and this leads to impaired bacterial recognition, increased permeability, enabled by stress. Stress has an effect on this permeability and microflora activity, in inefficient downregulation of the inflammatory response. I use abuse and war trauma, but it could also be, in her case, sexual and physical abuse. And then that leads to altered gut function and post infectious IBS. And that is enabled by the type of bacteria, the bad bacteria versus the good bacteria. So you have this interaction between the gut flora, the permeability of the gut, and then the release of mediators in the mucosal immune, mucosal area with uh, uh, cytokines and so on. Uh, you get, there's evidence in IBS that the proximity of the mast cell to the neural plexus is sound, seen more in IBS and correlates with pain. Closer the mast cell is, and its degranulation, the greater the pain. And here's a model to show how stress, shown here, can lead to a release of mediators. CRH is an inflammatory mediator in the gut, acetylcholine, and then you can get mast cell degranulation. You see more granules forming, and then this leads to uh, increased numbers. The tight junctions shown here in green eventually start to disappear. And then after that occurs, you can get, as you see, it disappears here. Then you get uh, the release of these peptidases and you get sensitization of the nerves. This is what we call visceral hypersensitivity. And then you get, with permeable, permeability, you get transmigration of cell products perpetuating this cycle. So what you see here is that with the infection, you get a shift to the curve, shift to the left of the, of the stimulus pain curve. This is pain reporting. As the stimulus gets more severe, if you did a rectal distension model, you can see in the healthy subject something like this. But with the insult, you get greater pain response to the same degree of, of distension. This is called hyperalgesia. If it's a painful stimulus, and allodynia, if it's an innocuous stimulus, so that's why a patient with IBS can eat a meal and they can have pain, whereas other people would have to overeat and have the same pain. The other thing we learned is that, uh, and this is with Rome 4, that these patterns, which we know from our own clinical experience, do shift. Uh, you can have, as she had, IBSD, and then she develops IBSC. Or you can have, without pain, functional constipation or functional diarrhea, typical constipation. But then later they can get pain, and then they go into the IBSC category. The IBS category is bowel dysregulation associated with pain. What do we add to that? We add to that opioids in our modern day and age. And what you're seeing here is a remarkable increased use of opioids in the U.S. and Canada compared to the rest of the world. But that's growing. This was six years ago. And that's become a, almost a, a, a Petri plate for understanding OIC and narcotic bowel because we're seeing more and more of these patients coming to us. Good news, uh, this is a study that we did with Lin Chang um, and it's coming out in gastroenterology is when we look at the database, of pres the prescription database, uh, gastroenterologists are decreasing in opioids. So we're aware of the problem. Uh, unfortunately, the neuromodulators have not changed Oh, uh, antispasmodics have gone up. This kind of patient doesn't respond well to antispasmodics. This is a chronic pain condition. So what the opioids do is slow everything down. You get decreased neurotransmitter release, suppression of propagated propulsive contractions in the colon and, and, and peristalsis of the bowel slows down. And then you get reduced excitability of secretive motor neurons. You get a drier stool, and then you get increase sympathetic outflow, and then you can get sensitization, which we'll talk about as well, both peripheral and uh, centrally. So in this population who are on opioids, 
um, of those who get a, who have chronic opioid use, about half will get OBD, which is uh, opioid bowel. Now the pharmaceutical companies have targeted the colon, so that's why you have a subset of that is OIC. But you can get, as you know, gastroparesis, ileus, all of that can occur. And then you can get this narcotic bowel, which you see is independent of whether you're constipation, because it works by a different mechanism. It's a central mechanism. So our three opioid effects are the opioid bowel, opioid-induced constipation, and narcotic bowel. Narcotic bowel is abdominal pain, is the predominant symptom, is a progressive and paradoxical increase of pain despite continued or escalating doses. So you see this patient in the emergency room on huge doses of Lauded or morphine, or getting them, and they get partial release for a while. But over time, you need to use higher and higher doses. So they get this adaptation, but they also get amplification of their pain experience. And as we'll show you in our series, they can they get better after you take them off the opioids, much like cannabinoid hyperemesis. You take them off the, the cannabinoid agents. And they I won't have time to go through this now, but there are a variety of agents. Uh, the ones to think about are the amoras or the, the opioid receptor antagonists uh, for opioid-induced constipation. So you can block the effect on the bowel in patients who need to be on uh, narcotics, the, the post-operative patients, and so on. Uh, and those would be the, the Relistur, Momantic, um, and Aldemidine of the three ones in this country. Uh, Alvimapan is mostly for small bowel post-operative patients. And then you can also sometimes use, uh, for opioid-associated constipation, your, your secretagogues like Linzess and Mephitizin. OK, but it didn't end there. <laughs> for those in the back, <laughs> it says, I'm afraid that your irritable bowel syndrome has progressed. You know how furious and vindictive bowel syndrome can be. We're talking about central sensitization. We're talking about how Intermittent bowel related symptoms become chronic and centrally mediated. Uh, the first way this can occur is in animal models, it's called the wind up phenomenon. And it's, I don't understand why it occurs, but it's a phenomenon that if you repeatedly sensitize the bowel through distension or chemicals uh, that irritate the bowel, uh, you get increased um, uh, signaling going from the spinal cord, the second neuron second order neuron going to the brain. And so you get increased signaling over time, and we call that central sensitization. And that occurs in the brain as well. And so what you're seeing, and you look at the population, if you're in the emergency room where you see someone with acute bowel obstruction or cholecystitis, they're being drawn from a healthy population. They have not had this experience. They have a peripheral problem. And once you fix that, everything gets better and nothing else needs to be done. But once you start getting chronic illness, like GERD or IBD, it impacts the person. Will I get sick again? Can I work? Will I die early? Will I need surgery? Mm -hmm. And it affects social and family relationships. And this has effects on encoding in the brain uh, to the point of when you have a functional GI disorder and when you get to the point of essentially mediated abdominal pain, where the CNS contribution is far greater than the peripheral. And with this person, you saw maybe 80, 90% peripheral that transferred to central. And this shows you an example of the, of, of the spectrum, uh, looking at the pre prevalence of mild, moderate, severe IBS in caps, which is centrally mediated. The severity of the pain keeps getting more. It goes from occasional meal-related, or menses related or stress-related, mm -hmm. intermittent episodes to more frequent, to constant. You get comorbidities, psychosocial diagnoses increase, anxiety, depression, somatization, uh, healthcare utilization increases, uh, fibromyalgia and, and the like. We call it in psychiatry, this is affective spectrum syndrome, where there's an absence of filtering of the brain. So you get fibromyalgia, you get back pain, you get TMJ, uh, and so on, because the brain is not able to filter out down-regulate somatic and visceral signals. And so you're moving from gut to brain. And the 
treatment should follow. So the criteria for centrally mediated abdominal pain is continuous or nearly continuous pain. Uh, and it's not necessarily related, to, like IBS, to eating or defecation. So these are, and you'll see patients with both. They'll say, well, I have pain all the time. It's worse when I eat, a little bit better when I defecate, but it doesn't go away. That's where the, the signal, the message to you is you have to treat the brain as well as the gut, because the FODMAP diet just isn't going to work in this case. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not, this is not malingering. Uh, this woman was not malingering. She was amplifying mm -hmm. to be listened to, but she wasn't malingering. This was, this was pain that she was experiencing. And here's evidence to show this. This is looking at the perceptual threshold to rectal distension model of discomfort, pain, and maximum pain. And you're looking at IBS here, and they have a lower sensation threshold compared to the control, which is in blue. But look at the chronic abdominal pain patient. They are the same as the healthy subject, which means that they aren't having, to any great degree, the visceral hypersensitivity. Their pain is related to what's going on rather than to amplify this rectal distension. And so what we're doing is moving from mild to severe from what we can call, um, and this is the proportion of patients in the milder, you're getting more IBS, which is afferent excitation. So you're having your visceral hypersensitivity, your motility problem, and this is mediated by peripheral agents and, and, and modulated by all these factors, mucosal inflammation, and, and, and I've talked about IBS, but let's talk about IBD as well. These are patients who may be in remission uh, histologically with biologic agents, but they have sensitization when they're seeing this chronic, uh, this painful, this hypersensitivity. And then it gets to the point when it's more severe that the psychosocial barriers kick in and you get disinhibition, disinhibition. That is a failure of the brain to downregulate incoming visceral signals because of these factors affecting the connections of the brain associated with limbic structures and so on. So in 2007, we reported this observation of seeing these patients who had severe pain coming to us and they, they just they had narcotic bowel syndrome. And this is the criteria. I want to focus that it's chronic pain with increasing doses of narcotics it's not explained by another GI diagnosis, and you, you have to have the pain worsens or incompletely resolves with continued or escalating dosages. The pain intensifies when the dose is reduced and subsides when narcotics are reinstituted. We call it a more sore crash. So you can put them on it, they're better than as they taper off the pain, it's much worse. And that's due to the central hyperalgesia, not to any underlying disease. And there's progression in the frequency duration now, I said that's a central mechanism. The, the, the anesthesiologist called centrally mediated opioid hyperalgesia. And it's predominantly related to activation of the glial cell, which when I went to med school was thought to be this nurturing cell that supports the nerves. It's actually an inflammatory cell. And factors can activate this like chronic opioid use, which leads to release of cytokines in the central nervous system increasing neuronal excitability, upregulating NMDA, and getting increased pain. And so with that background, oh, I see chronic pain. What are the psychosocial <coughs> behavior features? How is this being amplified by that? Well, she had the psychiatric conditions that we talked about. She had major depression. She had PTSD from early abuse. And then, of course, this reluctance we had did some uh, series of studies, NIH supported, that looked at uh, sexual abuse uh, and physical abuse mm -hmm. and health status, and we followed patients. And what you could see here is there was almost a dose effect that the more severe the abuse experience from uh, touch, contact, or rape, you could see greater pain intensity, more non-GI symptoms, more disability, mm -hmm. even greater risk for surgery. Mm -hmm. this, this would be the ejection fraction of 20, they say, maybe let's operate. Mm -hmm. But again, the, the pain behavior might be driving that decision. Uh, more psychological stress and more disability. And we tend to self-select. So the patients who have the more severe abuse are more likely to come to the doctor. 
So that's why when, when it, we first reported this in the annals in 1990, uh, this observation, we looked at the GI clinic, not my clinic, the GI clinic in general, and 50% of the women going there report the history of abuse. So you can see that in the referral center, the bargaining had been a higher level. Okay, what's the pathophysiology? So we're talking about the brain-gut axis. We know that signals go from the gut to the brain, but the brain has an ability to modulate this experience going down to the dorsal horn to up or down regulate or block or facilitate throughput. This is the gate that opens or closes. So uh, if you're running a race and you sprain your ankle, your focused attention on the race will block the pain. You won't feel it until afterwards. If you're walking down the street and someone gets hit by a car, or if you're in battle, someone gets mutilated, you could throw up or you could get really sick. And that's because the gate opens under stress. So it can close with things like hypnosis, cognitive behavioral work. It can open with stress, anxiety, fatigue, chronic illness, chronic pain, and the like. And so the psychosocial context can affect this. Your pain beliefs, there are cultural differences in pain reporting experience. There's expectation of conditioning. That's placebo effect. The, the, ex, the, the experience of, of something working or not working and the expectation that it'll work or not work becomes placebo or nocebo. We see a lot of patients, as you might too, who end up um, having pain and you put them on the medication. They say it's, it's an antidepressant and they don't want it and they get side effects. I took my first pill and I almost died. Yeah. Right. And that's not physiologic. That's that's expectation of, of nocebo effect. And then what comes into play after chronic symptoms is you get hyper focused on it, you can't distract yourself from it, and you can do what's called catastrophizing, which is a morbid preoccupation and pessimism. This won't get any better. An offloading of responsibility, doctor, you've got to do something for me, and so on. And then. Uh, anxiety and depression can affect it. There are genetic enablers. And of course, there can be amplified factors in gut level too. And then this can lead to, as we'll talk about, what we now see is that there are structural changes that can occur that perpetuate the system. So you're moving from a healthy state with a descending modulatory system to that works to an overactive, affective, and impaired cognitive circuit psychologically, and this impairs the descending modulatory system and you get the chronic pain condition. And when you do brain imaging, you can see that those with this type of, pain, of, of condition tend to have the, uh, the modulatory regions get more involved with emotional areas like the amygdala, and the supergenual uh, ACC, anterior mid cingulate, as opposed to the more the healthy state of salience or re normal regulation of pain, which involves the insula, which is the somatosensory cortex of the gut and the thalamus. So this shifts into a more emotional-based center. And this is work we did. We had a study to look at what the amplification effect of abuse is on patients with IBS. These were women, and we did a rectal distension model, and you can see that those with the abuse history had higher pain scores, significantly higher than those with just IBS. So they, IBS had hypersensitivity, but they had more. And this was associated with a greater activation of this cingulate cortex area. And this correlated with the pain versus the pain area. So we had a window in saying that whatever's going on in the brain with PTSD or, is somehow making this pain regulation system work. Now we get on to the idea of what happens when this occurs. And what we're learning is that abuse, chronic pain conditions, functional GI disorders are associated with reduced neuronal density. It's like the, the, these control areas wear out and they die out. And that may be why she went from intermittent pain to chronic pain. Some of the earliest work, this is 15 years now, was Doug Bremner, who looked at uh, Gulf War vets who had PTSD, and he looked at the hippocampus, which is a, an area of the brain that's related to coding and memory. These are the, the soldiers who get flashbacks and, 
and, and the impairment of the hippocampus would make them think that smelling something would, would bring them back as if it happened yesterday when it was 10 years earlier. And so they, they, they had a reduction, in, about a 15 reduction, percent reduction in those who had PTSD compared to deployed without or reserves or healthy civilians. And this correlated with delayed birth and memory. So that was the beginning. And then lots of studies started to come out that showed that major depression, the sexual and physical birth, he did a study looking at that, uh, chronic somatic pain, IBS, even chronic painful pancreatitis is associated with reduction. So those patients who you see who have, quotes chronic pancreatitis, you don't want to stent them if there's not good reason. You want to just treat them with pharmacologic agents because this is essential sensitization as a result of the chronic inflammation, not something active at the level of the pancreas. And here's the evidence in IBS in that singlet area showing reduced neuronal density. So what's the management approach? Well, what I was trying to show you is this gradation when you're seeing patients, this distinction about to what degree is the gut playing a role and to what degree is the central taking over. She was 90% central. She started with hormones. And so then you want to look at not just gut pharmacologic agents, which may not be as helpful, although we might have put her on romantic or something like that, but then we could look at central neuromodulator psychological treatments, multidisciplinary approach, with the idea of improving function in the presence of pain, not elimination of pain, certainly some reduction possible. So we have this spectrum that with the milder forms of IBS, you're going to use lifestyle, diet, medications, probiotics, but you move on to the central neuromodulators, behavioral intervention, and then the augmentation. We published uh, a few years ago uh, patients that we brought into UNC and detoxified them who met criteria for narcotic diet. And look at what we found. This was a one-week detoxification. We basically gave them a continuous IV. It was non-contingent dropped by about 15 to 20 percent a, uh, a day each day to coming off and you're seeing about a 30 percent reduction in their pain scores on using the BAS and if we follow them we we had the North Carolina registry and those who stayed off narcotics had a 75 percent reduction in pain but these were patients who then went back to their family doctors were retreated and those who went back the pain went Almost a proof of concept about what role this was playing. Which is the card, which is the horse there, Doug? I mean, is it they st they were able to stay off narcotics because they had less pain, or they had to go back on narcotics because well, they were having more pain? They what had less it? pain, but they still went back. Even so, and happened. some of that, what we found from our interviews, was the patients wanted to be on. Uh, and the other was the doctors were prescribing to us. They didn't know what else to do if they had a little bit of pain, uh, as opposed to keeping them off. This was a young woman who was on uh, 400 milligrams of morphine equivalent, 80 milligrams of Dilaudid for months, and she reported her pain as 10 out of 10. Uh, we, within two days, she was eating, uh, began eating, and she had a, she had a GJ tube. She couldn't eat, and they, we took the tube out, and within two days she was eating. That's dramatic. I do this as a marketing yeah. thing. <laughs> it's not always that way, but but the series, you can see the results. The problem is you're, you're alluding to, uh, David, is the recidivism rate, that if you look at when they, how, when they get off and go back on, that by one year, about only about 25% are still off opioids, oh. most of them. Even at three months, half of them were back in the office. We published a paper last year, uh, actually 2018, uh, on neuromodulators. We're changing the terminology from antidepressants to antipsychotics because it's stigmatized. Yeah. And what we said is that consistent with the Rome Foundation's guidelines, uh, we're calling them gut-brain neuromodulators. And the central neuromodulators are antidepressants, anti-anxiety 
psychotics. And the ones acting on the enteric nervous system is serotonergic agents like velocitron, chloride-channel agents like benzes, ramatiza, delta ligand like pregabalin, and so on. So by using that method, we can then convince the patient, and also uh, doctors may be more amenable to prescribe it when they're talking from a physiologic model of pain management and comorbidity. <coughs> so these are the agents. The antidepressants, like anything else, get familiar with one in each class, and I will talk a little bit about this. Uh, the peripheral agents we talked about in the today here. So the rationale for treating um, is that you can treat comorbidity, comorbid anxiety, depression. It has peripheral effects. It may reset the brain's dysregulation. It may lead to neurogenesis. So the signaling goes up here. And then the brain has the ability to send down signals to block the pain. We showed this before through a noradrenergic and serotonergic pathways. Keep that in mind because that's going to play a role in which ones you use. Here's a really fun study uh, that was done um, where they, they basically took healthy individuals and created a pain state. And they looked at pain by burning the skin. And what they did is they wanted to see if brain areas were affected and whether mood would make a difference. So they induced a depressive state. How did they do it? Well, they, they did what's called Belton statements, and they had the subjects repeat over and over again, life is not worth living, my life is a mess, I'm a failure, all negative statements. While they played a very morbid music, it was Prokofiev's uh, Russia under the Mongolian yoke, at half speed, very slow, while they repeated this. They measured their depression. They, they had increased sadness, and they had increased pain. More than the neutral <laughs> And here what you're looking at is the neutral group activation to some degree with the pain of the somatosensory and the cingulate area. But look how much more activation they have here. And the blue is, is down regulation, which wasn't occurring here. So we have now evidence that in an experimental model, the induced state of sadness is associated with lower sensation threshold as evidenced by the brain imaging. Peripheral effects. I think it's good to keep in mind that neuroadrenergic effects slow down the bowel and serotonergic effects increase the bowel. Here you're seeing the TCA, which is neuroadrenergic, slowing down the bowel, and healthy NIBS and SSRIs increasing. Interestingly, with tricyclics, for example, as you increase the dose, you actually get reduced signaling at the level of the gut. It's not just a CNS effect, but what you're seeing here is in these rats, the pelvic atrial nerve discharge diminishes as you increase the dose. And then, as we said, you get this uh, resetting of the brain's dysfunction and its inability to downregulate. So I like to tell patients that at the beginning, they may have had hypersensitivity then the brain is not working as well, and we can reset it. So the model for the neurogenic theory, uh, this we had at DTW, the world lectureship by Tariq Pereira, who's at Columbia, uh, was, was showing that with a predisposition of early life, you can, you can get to a point. Somehow there's pointers now. So you can see that uh, chronic illness, drug abuse, social issues can lead to increased vulnerability. And what you're seeing here is reduction in neurogenesis. This is in the hippocampus. And that with treatment, you can get restored neurogenesis. And here's an example. Uh, this is a, a, a model of patients who are undergoing hip surgery. Now, the nice thing about osteoarthritis is that it's chronic pain that has a dramatic response to surgery. The pain goes away. So what they did is they looked at the cingulate cortex, at the density of the nerves in these patients before surgery compared to healthy controls. And the yellow demonstrates reduced density. And so they had neurodegeneration. And then four months after surgery, they looked at the density of 
the cingulate cortex compared to the pretreatment levels. And the orange indicates increased density. So there may be, as a result of the limit of the loss of the pain, this, this effect of neurogenesis. Here's a laboratory model. They created traumatic brain injury in mice. And what you're looking at is how they function in the maze. And this is the, uh, the percent of functioning and the, the saline traumatic brain injury had lower performance than the control shown in blue and yellow. But they pre-treated after this group who had traumatic brain injury with the mipramine, tricyclic antidepressant, and within two weeks, they equaled the performance and even got better. And then they sacrificed the animals and looked at KI67 cells, which is a precursor, RNA precursor, nerve cell growth, and looked at the density of the mipramine group in two weeks to the control group. So these are the painful GI disorders that you would want to target in the functional GI realm. And I would also mention, because this is Mount Sinai, that this is the patients with IBD, IBS that you want to target. If they have pain that's not explained by the degree of inflammation, you're going to think about using these neuromodulators. Well, you know about the reuptake theory. Basically, these medications increase, uh, decrease reuptake so that you have more signaling going to the postsynaptic, and then that, that tends to help with the pain. Now, this is a good slide to look at uh, because when we look at the classes, I, I know when, I, when Trevor and I'm talking about this, most people say 25 milligrams of yeah. Well, that, that's, that's, that's old wisdom, and it may help, but there's, there's newer evidence to say there are other ways to go. And the tricyclics have multiple receptors, noradrenergic, serotonergic, uh, muscarinic, histaminic, and because of that, they can get side effects if you go too high. Whereas the SSRIs have no noradrenergic, only serotonergic. Remember I said before, pain management requires noradrenergic and serotonergic. So this is not going to work for pain. It may help for anxiety associated mm -hmm. Not for pain itself. The SNRIs is my preference because you don't have, it's not as dirty a drug. This is a, a complex a, a agent like mirtazapine, which we can also use for nausea and sleep and the like. So, serotonergic, serotonergic, you want that, you get benefit with DCAs, you don't get it with SSRIs. The SNRIs, you get it. But you don't get the side effects leading to dry mouth, blurry vision, orthostatic hypertension, and the like. And here, what you see is that there's less side effects. Main side effect is nausea, which can be better when you don't when you take it with a meal. I'm going to skip this because I've already talked about it. Uh, psychologic therapies is another way to go. Um, the NMTs for these are even better than medications in some cases. And the nice part about these interventions is that the patients carry it with them. Uh, and so they, they don't need, after they're finishing treatment, they don't need to uh, uh, continue. They, can, they, they, they have absorbed the, me the mechanism for management. And you know, you have a great person here running a program who's leading the field in this area. So I think it's, uh, it's very important to have I think the problem is the resources. Are those intent to treat numbers or per protocol numbers? These are intent to treat. Wow. Um, I borrowed this from Lori, uh, just showing of when would you refer uh, if if you if you, if you can if the patient can make the connection between what if your brain is open to the possibility of behavioral change uh, and and when it's time to participate in therapy. Our CBT trial, we looked at the predictors of response, and there were three factors a belief that they could control it, um, a belief in the treatment, and the interaction with the therapist. Those were the factors. Uh, almost done. Sorry, we're trying to go fast. Augmentation treatment is what we do uh, when patients who come to us who are on an antidepressant is not working. You do what the psychiatrists do, you can add a second drug and you can reduce side effects by dropping the dose, adding a second. And uh, and this is just showing that 
But if you want to do augmentation, you might want to get a psychiatric referral with the caveat that what we're teaching about use of these agents for GI problems are not what psychiatrists are familiar with. So they know about treating psychiatric disorders. They can talk about interaction effects, but they're not going to be choosing the drugs that we're trying to promote. And then a clinical would be adding psychological treatment to it. So this is, I think, a little bit more complex. I refer you to the article, but you start with one of these agents and you can do augmentation. I tend to use the atypical antipsychotics uh, like Seroquel in addition to an SNRI as my target drug. Relapse prevention, we keep them on it for a year. And the reason why is just like in psychiatry, if you take a patient with major depression, you put them on the agent for uh, three months, and you take them off at 50% of relapse. Put them on it for a year, maybe 20 or 30 percent of the lives, because of this neurogenesis hypothesis. The last thing to mention is that there are pharmacogenomic testing that can be done. So we can, uh, I, I often use it as a way to help patients understand that they're not allergic to everything. Uh, this is, and, and we had a study that showed that the, the side effects that they report to antidepressants are related to anxiety. Psychologic scores not due to the blood level of the drug. So let's look at how we approach this. Well, Ms. Byers, from, from the exam, I can see you are having a lot of pain there. Uh, even on my exam, you have a, a fair amount of stool over on the right side, so you have a lot of constipation. Yeah. I agree with you, and maybe that the constipation is not causing the pain, but we have to try to figure out what are best treatment options for you. Uh, I don't know how much you know about what, what's going on, and I wonder if we should take some time for me to explain to you why you're having all these symptoms. Would that be okay? Sure. Well, you know, it may have began when you um, went to Mexico. You had some occasional pain in childhood, but when you went to Mexico, you got something that we call post-infection IBS. And when you got an infection, what we find, as you see here, that the lining of the, of the bowel can get disrupted with an infection because of bad bacteria. And that leads to bacteria coming in and it actually alters the nerves. And this is what we do for sensitivity. So with you, if you eat a meal or if you just have pain in general, you're having much more pain than someone else who didn't have this occur. So this is what happened at the level of the bowel and that's how it may have started for you. But it, gets, it got to be more challenging. Now, I want to show you this diagram that what you have is really a combination of increased sensitivity of the bowel, we call that visceral hypersensitivity, from that infection, and a failure of the brain to control that, that pain that's coming from the bowel. Now, if you're running a race and you sprain your ankle, you know, during the race, you may not feel that pain, right? Yeah. And then after the race, you might not be able to walk. Right. Why do you think that is? Because of adrenaline? Well, that's pretty much something like that. What's happening is that the brain has the ability to control what's going on in the bowel in terms of pain and motility. And in these conditions, you have not only increased what we call signaling or activity going to the brain, but a failure of the brain to control it. So we have a dysregulation of what we call the brain gut axis. This is going to continue and maybe even get worse because the pain is making you anxious and depressed. You are upset. You're getting no relief from anybody. You're getting frustrated. You feel nobody understands you. Yeah. And in that regard, that's affecting your brain and making it even more difficult. So and you know, the pain's not in my head, it's real. The brain is not doing its job of controlling the bowel. So we have to be able to resolve not only the pain, but the emotional distress around it, because that's making the pain worse too. Hmm. And you know, what we've learned is that over time, the brain starts not only to lose its function, but we have evidence that the brain cells can actually die out. We call that neurodegeneration. Now that sounds really bad, doesn't it? But there are treatments that we can use that can help regrow those nerves. And we call that neurogenesis. Yeah, that's helpful. Thank you. No one's ever shown me that before. 
Okay. So some of the things we can do is that at this point in time, the IBS component has become maybe less important than this chronic abdominal pain, which we call centrally mediated abdominal pain, and the effect of opioids, which are making the constipation worse, and it might even be making the pain worse. We call that narcotic bowel. Well, what I'd like to do is to work with you to put you on a medication that might help improve the brain's ability to control the pain. And we, we call that uh, a, an SNRI. It's a type of antidepressant, but it's one that's used for pain in particular. In fact, some of the SNRIs aren't even used for depression. They're just used for pain. Huh. And let me ask you this. If you could feel 25% better in a couple of months, would that be helpful to you? 25, yeah, that would be great. Then I could maybe get my job back. Well, and let me go a little further, that we want to keep you on it for longer, for maybe about a year, because then we might be able to take you off the medication, and you may not have to go back on it again. These medications and these treatments might help to regrow those nerves, rewire things, so that eventually you may not be able to be on it. Wow, that would be great. My concern is that the narcotics are contributing to the constipation. Now, we can put you on medication for the constipation due to narcotics. Okay. But I'm also wondering if eventually we can get you off on narcotics completely. But not right, like not today. <laughs> well, we can looking to abandon you in pain so eventually we may want to take you off it and we can we can decide together about that okay we'll make that decision together right okay so if you're okay we're going to talk more about the medication and then we'll set up an appointment to see you uh, in about two or three weeks okay okay all right that sounds good thank you okay so there was a lot here well and just to cover what was done in five minutes was giving her a diagnosis, validating the symptoms, stating the diagnosis, using diagrams, getting a physiologic, not getting, getting away from a psychiatric to a more physiologic model of dysregulation, talking about the vicious cycle, describing what the brain gun acts. By the way, we, we made a card of that image, and on the back we have a description, so if you want to take your patients, we can give that to you. And there's a QR code where you can see this is a video of how I explain it. So uh -huh. that's available. Just uh, talk to contact out. Bruce. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll get you the cards. Uh, assess their understanding. And you can see she was more engaged, focused on management, not studies. Gave the rationale. Set realistic expectations. These are patients with chronic pain who may want cure, but you could say, if we can yeah. get you 25% better in a couple of months, are we on the right path? And that's that's another way to do it. And we work together in decision making. Uh, and I accepted her choice not to come off opioids because I wanted to engage with her enough to get some benefit. Then we would readdress yeah. the narcotics when she has that trust. And then continue to work with the pain with the patient. Remember, I said we're not going to abandon you in pain. Very important message to the patients. This is what we we have a model. We can get this to you. Last yeah. two items in any interaction. If I answer all your questions, uh, and regardless of how things go, we will work on this together. What, what an incredible talk. Um, we can't take questions because of the time, but I think maybe if people afterwards want to come up. Um, but I just want to say, from my perspective, what your work has done over your entire career is really um, even gastroenterologists, the language to even talk about these things, and that may be the most important thing that you've done for the field, in my, my view. And I couldn't think of a better lecture or lecturer uh, to commemorate uh, Charles Gerson, and I want to thank you so much and give you something so that you will always remember this as well, something to put on your wall proudly, which says that you are the second so Charles Gerson memorial lecturer. We'll put this on the room. Social media, good, okay. It will be the first and last time I will be on the Rome Foundation social media. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.
Thank you so much.